Up next on Eco Company. Who is afraid of a little mud? It's pretty squishy. <laughs> We're learning how to make Adobe bricks. Go. Yay! And that's not all. We're also giving solar cooking a try. Plus, keep your eyes peeled. We are uh, here to observe and record all the vertebrates, mostly birds, including the cowgoinger quail, the magpies, and the acorn woodpecker. Students on the hunt for wildlife. We counted about 23 birds. It's all in a day's work for these guys. And talk about a big microscope. How these teens are using it to study photosynthesis. It's one way to create biofuel. Then it's up, up, up in the air. It's a NASA satellite that's giving us the lowdown on what's going on up there. Water vapor is the greenhouse gas. Eco Company starts now. Hey guys, I'm Brendan. And I'm Jelena. Thanks for joining us on Eco Company. First up, we've got some Creek Geeks who show us there's a lot more to nature than meets the eye. They're part of an award-winning program run by students. Let's go see what they're up to. Imagine if this was part of your school uniform. <laughs> or if you spent part of your day outside with a pair of these. Oh, day oh, just moved. And how about wrestling with all this? These high schoolers are doing it all, and then some. They're students from Mira Loma High School in Sacramento, California. And they're behind the Arcade Creek Project. Well, the motto for the past 11 years has been eradication, restoration, and education. And um, what the Arcade Creek Project is all about is sort of restoring the creek back to how it was before. It's run by juniors and seniors in the school's International Baccalaureate Science Program. Science instructor Dean Karajanis is one of the advisors. It's a totally student-run project. Taylor, we need to start right here. Students are the managers, the leaders. The goal is to both keep an eye on and clean up this urban watershed that has its share of environmental problems. Currently, we have a significant amount of invasive species that are found throughout our creek. Because a lot of the creek water is actually from runoff and irrigation systems by the community, um, there's a lot of um, algal bloom and things in the water that aren't supposed to be there either. That could be anything from like trash to like chemicals that have flown down from people's lawns and stuff. What trends are we at three? From hands-on field studies. Mission accomplished. To analysis back at the labs. These guys are taking back their creek. I see it on her face. By monitoring nearly a dozen aspects of the creek's ecosystem. What we do is we map erosion patterns, we find impurities in the creek, and we try to figure out what we can do and what everyone else can do to fix them. Today we've got the habitat, restoration, vertebrates, long mapping, biological assessment, and chemistry teams ready to show us how it's done. The mappers put these on, because soon they'll be <laughs> knee deep in this. I like being outdoors and such, which is why I chose to do long mapping because you actually get to be in the creek. They're wading through the murky water to measure the creek's path. So we have a tripod and then we use the rangefinder. There's a laser that comes out of it and we hit the points on the creek and then it measures the distance there. So every time the creek curves, we measure another point. And then we like connect the lines and then we have the curve of the creek. We look at the maps that we've had from last year and compare it to what we would get this year to see where the water has fallen and how the water lines have changed to sort of see how the creek has eroded and such. It's 10 meters by 10 meters. Nearby, the habitat group is hard at work too. It's their job to look at physical features like bank height, 1.1 meter, tree diameters, 4.2 centimeters, and foliage. We've got 1.2, 1.1. So we're measuring how far out the branches go out from the tree. It determines how much sunlight enters the area of the creek. It's really important in determining um, what kind of species can live here. They also use this little gadget. What we have is a piece of equipment called the densiometer, and it's like this little box where there's circles and there's a grid inside. And what we do is we hold it out in front of us and measure the foliage that is overhead. And then you count how many squares are covered by the branches, and for this one, it's 100%. How many trees you have and what kind of foliage that you have overhead really determines what can live over here. She's not just talking about plant life, but wildlife too. That's where the vertebrates team comes in. We count about 23 birds. They're armed with binoculars and these. We 
are here to observe and record all the vertebrates, mostly birds. They're looking for large populations of certain species. That's uh, a way for us to assess the health of the creek because of the indicator species that we have, including the California quail, the magpies, and the acorn woodpecker. So um, the more we have of those, it's an indication that the creek is quite healthy. <laughs> yep, it's a nuttles. If they find more non-native invasive species, that's a sign of trouble. And speaking of invasives, there are plenty of those down here. Um, I'm part of the restoration group, and what we basically do is we eradicate invasive species. That's this stuff. They're plants that shouldn't be here because they're not native to the area. Today we've removed catalpa and arundo because they suck up a lot of water and they actually um, make it really hard for the native plants to survive. People really need to be careful about what's going down their water drains because most of the invasive species that have um, sprung out from the creek are because people are just like leaving like the seeds and stuff and it's going down in the drain and it's really affecting the creek. Now let's talk about what's in the water. This is where we keep all of our samples. That's what chem and bio students are studying back in the lab. I really enjoy being a part of the Art Creek, Creek Project because it allows an opportunity to really um, take a part in environmental reclamation. The chemistry team checks out water quality. They're testing things like nitrate and phosphate levels. Right here we're looking at nitrates. It's, uh, it's very important for determining how much plants can grow. Basically, if we see spikes within those, that is a sign that there must be runoff of nitrate-containing um, compounds, which are things like fertilizers, etc. Our creek isn't too healthy right now, so yeah. Another way they can tell how toxic the water is? By looking under the microscope. So biological assessment um, looks in the benthic layer of the creek for macroinvertebrates, which are kind of like insect, larvae, or um, worms that kind of show how the creek is doing. The thing that we're looking for is this mayfly, um, which has a low toxicity tolerance. It shows that the creek is less toxic. So from the lab <laughs> to along the creek bed and in the water, these students are dedicated to protecting and preserving the planet in every way they can. This is a very you know, efficient and wonderful study. Uh, it allows us to help out our community. I thought that before we'd be getting all muddy and gross every time we're out here, but I really like coming out here because it seems like the air is clean and it's fun to be out here with your friends. It feels really great to be a part of this. I'm gonna miss it because I really do love this project. I love getting out here and I love uh, doing my small part to help the environment. It's a passion for the planet they hope to pass on to us all. The environment is really all we have. I mean, without it, like, humans can be nothing. So it's really important for us to really understand that um, we have to appreciate the environment for what it is and we can't destroy it. It's really important to civilization. Yeah, I have wonderful kids. Geothermal energy, photosynthesis, sounds like research for scientists, right? Well, in this case, those scientists are teens and they're learning about renewable energy and more in a national lab. This may look like your ordinary classroom at the average school, but these guys aren't in school here at all. They're interning at one of the nation's top labs. These high schoolers are part of the Summer BLIPS program at the U.S. Department of Energy Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. BLIPS is uh, the Berkeley Lab internship for pre-collegiate scholars. How are you guys doing? Tom Knight is its program manager. We partner high school students in the summer after their junior year with a researcher here at Berkeley Lab to do scientific research. A lot of research is environmental, involving renewable energy, fuel efficiency, and more. And high schoolers like Francis from Puerto Rico are getting to be a part of it all. I'm learning a lot and having fun here. She's studying geothermal energy at the geysers, the largest geothermal plant in the world. My favorite parts are the field trips, the geysers and the Santa Rosa. Geothermal energy taps water from the Earth's core, where it's hot. It creates steam, which generates electricity. So why is geothermal better than any fossil fuels? Well, it's better because it's natural and it doesn't make any damage to the environment. It doesn't release CO2 or anything. It doesn't. It's like really clean and pure. In this case, there's an added twist. They're using recycled water to make that steam. We're getting the water, the wastewater that comes from home, businesses, and industry. The wastewater goes through a series of different treatment steps so that it's been very, very cleaned up. And then it goes through a 41 mile long pipeline 
up to the geysers, goes up about 3,000 feet in elevation, and then it is distributed to a variety of different injection wells where it's put back into the geothermal reservoir. Geological scientist Pat Dobson is mentoring Francis as she puts together an educational outreach presentation. We're trying to increase the awareness and knowledge of geothermal energy to the general public. What Francis is doing is putting together a web page that will provide information to the general public and go and find out more about this process. So to solve climate change, we're basically turning back to mother nature, what with like solar using the sun, wind using wind, right. <laughs> and now geothermal using the, the, the heat earth. of the earth. And yeah. so, I mean, if we're looking at energy solutions, it's gotta be more than just one answer. The, the needs for power are so great. That brings us to this lab, where students are studying another way to replace carbon-emitting fossil fuels, and that's with plants. They're the source of life, practically, because they provide the oxygen we need, and they clean the air that we breathe. Camila and Maxine are creating a movie about photosynthesis, and ways scientists are trying to produce it artificially in order to create fuel. Scientists nowadays are trying to find a more efficient and cheaper way to make fuel storable and to reach uh, the world's demand. The problem is that natural photosynthesis doesn't reach that demand. They're using this electron microscope to scope out plant cells. They're looking at the structure of chloroplasts, where photosynthesis occurs. Artificial photosynthesis mimics natural photosynthesis. And instead of producing the sugars and ATP that is produced by natural photosynthesis, artificial photosynthesis produces a fuel that's storable and transportable. All of their work goes into their video. It's a project that requires T for teamwork. Well, it's pretty cool to have somebody to like, we have like a check and balance for each other. <laughs> yeah, that way it's very fun. Whether it's using energy from beneath the ground or figuring out how to copy nature above it. Nature is like the basics of why we're here. These teens say they're glad to be a part of finding solutions to environmental problems. I think we've grown as students and as scientists and it's made us more conscious of the problem of how and how people around the globe are working on it. And for these budding scientists, this is just the beginning. Think you need to be in your kitchen to bake cookies? Up next, we test that theory outside in a solar oven. Right after I try my hand at building bricks out of mud. And later, move over CO2 and methane. There's another greenhouse gas in town. And this NASA scientist tells us why we haven't heard much about it. More Eco Company is next. Making bricks out of mud and baking cookies in a solar oven. These are just two ways to live sustainably, and Jelena's rolling up her sleeves to show us how it's done. Forget rolling up my sleeves. This sweater's coming off. There's a lot of work to do, and I'm ready to get started. Welcome to the school farm, a place where if you want to cook, it'll be in one of these. And if you build something, it'll look like this. From making adobe bricks to cooking in here, this nonprofit co-op run by the Ecology Center of San Francisco is serious about showing us how to live lighter on the planet. Sam Hartman and Davin Wentworth Thrashers are two of the educators here. They've got a full house. These teens are here on a field trip with Build On. Build On is an international nonprofit. We get involved with high school students and we engage them in out of the classroom activities. There's definitely plenty to keep everyone busy here. Wondering what this is? It's a chicken coop and it's made of all natural materials like adobe brick. And now it's time for me to go make some. All right, the shoes are coming off. Okay, so what do we have to do here? All right, all we have to do is mix the 75% sand Which aggregate, correct, with the 25% clay just by stomping our feet. It's kind of like stomping grapes, although maybe not quite as squishy. It's pretty squishy. <laughs> squishy and yes, a bit messy too. This is actually just like uh, you might get at a spa, you know, get to rub some nice uh, minerals on you. When they first stump on it, it's so slippery, especially when they added the water. Next comes the straw, which helps bind the brick together. Yeah, some people call this a little chicken dance, you know, but you add just a little bit and sprinkle it in. 
After a few minutes of our chicken dance, let's see if this stuff makes the grade. There. See when it stays together like that? That's a nice solid mass. That means you've got a great building material. Looks like we're in business. Really pack it in there. So um, you were out building bricks, right? How did you like it? I think it's awesome. It's a really, I mean, it's a really dirty activity, but it's just great. I mean, you're helping the environment and everyone's having fun. I really think it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and do you want to teach other people how to do this since now you know how to do it? Yes. Yeah. It's fun. Getting students in the out of doors, building bricks, um, as well as building community with one another. Um, that, that's our big focus. Now it's my turn. Hold the brick down, slide the Kay. foam off, and there we go. Whoa. That's so cool. Davin says they'll use these bricks to build an outdoor classroom. Now that our work is done, it's time for some food. They've got pizza cooking in the cob oven, and check out the solar ovens. Using reflectors, they capture the sun's infrared rays to create heat. So the basic idea is it's capturing that solar infrared heat energy and trapping it under the glass, kind of like the greenhouse effect. But this is a good greenhouse effect. How does it being solar affect the cooking? Does it take longer or? You know, it, it really doesn't. It'll cook anything your oven at home would cook. Looks like the temp's right where we want it. I brought some cookies and I'm ready to throw them on and try out the solar oven. All right, let's do it. Let's put these in. All right. Now we just have to wait. Why is it important to use a solar oven and not a regular oven that's in your house? Well, the solar oven is using this abundant source of solar energy that's all around us. And if you can capture that energy and use it for something like cooking, that's energy you don't have to use from your power plant, which is burning fossil fuels. About 30 minutes later, presto! It looks like our cookies are ready. And I've worked up an appetite. Mmm, these look delicious. From getting our exercise to the not so difficult task of watching these bake under the sun, we'd call this all in a good day's work. Mm. We hear a lot about the greenhouse gas CO2, but did you know that water vapor also plays a big role in global warming? Up next, NASA scientists tell us why it's important and how they're keeping track of it. More Eco Company is next. Infrared technology, 3D imaging, these are just two ways NASA helps us understand our planet. Especially when it comes to greenhouse gases, and one of them we don't hear too much about. Adam brings us the scoop from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It drives hurricanes, forms clouds, and carries energy across the globe. So just what is this formidable force of nature? It's the greenhouse gas you haven't heard much about. The water vapor is the greenhouse gas. Carbon dioxide is the next one down. The next one after that is methane. Then we also have ozone. These greenhouse gases are what NASA scientist Ed Olson is studying as part of the AIRS project. AIRS stands for the Atmospheric Infrared Sounder, a uh, instrument on the Aqua spacecraft, which is in a polar orbit. We make 300,000 observations per day, land, ocean, pole to pole. 300,000 measurements a day? Yes. We slice and dice the atmosphere. It looks down at the Earth and measures infrared energy. That's heat from the sun absorbed by the planet and re-emitted into the atmosphere. We feel it as heat on our own bodies. The warmer areas in my body are showing up as deep red. The cool areas in the background are, are blue. AIRS uses that heat radiance to track water cycles, temperatures, and concentrations of greenhouse gases across the globe, like carbon dioxide. So why are people talking about carbon dioxide so much more than water vapor when that's the number one greenhouse gas? Well, because carbon dioxide, we think we can put our arms around one of the sources because it comes out of smokestacks, it comes out of our various human activity. There's not much we can do about water vapor. Most of it comes from evaporating oceans. And remember, the planet's two-thirds water. As we warm up a little bit, the atmosphere can carry more water vapor, which has an amplification factor on warming. Water vapor forms clouds, and depending on where they are, they can either reflect the sun's heat or keep it from escaping. Some of it goes up, some of it goes back down again, 
And that's how we can maintain our particular temperature that we know and love here on the surface of the Earth. It's all part of the puzzle of how our planet could change in the future as it reacts to higher levels of greenhouse gases, be it natural or man-made. We can only attempt to control the things that we emit ourselves. It's a roadmap for the future that can help guide our actions now. If your campus is doing something to go green, we want to hear about it. Grab your video camera and start rolling. Create a video and upload it to our website at eco-company.tv. Well, that's it for us this week. Thanks for tuning in. Check out our website at eco-company.tv. And you can find us on Facebook. We'll see you back here next time. On Eco Company. Eco Company.